All right, and I want to welcome you all. I think this is going to be rather fascinating. Um, so I want to introduce you to Ross Beveridge. He's a professor emeritus at Colorado State University. He started research into the field of artificial intelligence in 1984 and has enjoyed a front row seat for more than half the life of the field. His areas of expertise include computer vision, giving computers the ability to see and the human and human computer interaction involving sight, gesture, and speech. Along the way, he has also explored ways of evaluating AI systems, for example, when recognizing faces. Does a system favor one race over another, for example? He has also explored how modern learning in AI may be understood in terms of high dimensional geometry. That'll be interesting. I've never heard about that one. He retired in 2022 and has recently moved to Humboldt County and is currently traveling. We had to move his proposed date because he wanted to go see the eclipse, which of course I did. So we're looking forward to this talk. If you have questions, please put them in the chat. If they're immediately relevant, we will interrupt him and ask it, but otherwise he'll take it, uh, take your questions probably at the end. Thank you very much for coming. Our new semester, by the way, starts in June, I believe, and we'll have our first brown bag lunch again, I believe, on the 17th or something of that nature. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing you again. You have to start your new membership all over again uh, for the next year. So we'll be having an open house, and you'll be all notified about that, and we hope you'll come. And you'll get an opportunity at some point along the line here to see our new office and space at the Stewart School and a classroom, which is nice and large, and very bright. And there's good parking, so we don't ha won't have to worry about parking. So we'll be happy to see you here. And Ross, it's all yours. Thank you so much. Let me uh, bring up some slides and get going here. Well, it worked when we practiced. My apologies to everybody. And it is. There we go. At least we're getting rolling. Trust the computer scientist not to know how to start a slideshow. Everyone's seeing my slides. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, Thank you very much for this opportunity. I realize this thing, it may be my first true post-retirement talk. And I'm kind of excited to have an audience that doesn't consist of a lot of um, people a lot like me with years of thinking too much about high dimensional geometry and artificial intelligence. Um, it's a field I happen to love and that's gonna come through. Um, and I'm gonna do my best to sort of take excerpts of what I've seen over my career that I think are hopefully of interest to you. And I'm going to very much start with, um, we're curious creatures. Um, and the point of this slide is to emphasize that I don't look at computers as somehow an unnatural, weird side show in the great human drama of becoming what it means to be smart, engaged, caring humans. I actually view it as one of the most natural outgrowths of being people. Um, we think hard about the world around us, and that <laughs> includes thinking about us. Um, I did sh throw shamelessly the cover of Gertel Escher Bach into this slide, and Jane already was happy to see it. I read this before I ever went back to graduate school, and I just have to say, if you're interested in sort of thought and thinking and ideas, it's a wonderful book. So with that, my advancement's not working. That works, okay. Um, I'm designing this as a reflection. Things that, you know, I was born in 1957. So was the term artificial intelligence. It was actually a small group of people who gathered at Dartmouth 
Um, they are now sort of considered the founders of AI. Um, and everything that we look at today that goes by that name, much of it was envisioned back then. But now I want to take a right turn. Um, AI may only be less than a century old, but human beings have been storing knowledge for a long time. It's probably one of the most defining characteristics of what it means to be human. Um, I love the sentence, the book is a treasure trove of knowledge. That's a fascinating sentence because frankly, the book is a bunch of paper with stuff marks on it, but we don't see it that way. We see it as knowledge. And I'm gonna come back to that, but because I very much like to see computer science, AI, and pretty much everything we do in a bit of a historical context, I'm going to shamelessly take us back a long way to uh, Lao Tzu and the Tao Te Ching. Um, I got introduced to this before I ever started studying AI, but when I started studying computer science deeply, what I really loved about the first four lines, and no, I haven't read the whole Tao Te Ching, Tao Te Ching well, but a book on knowledge that starts with a warning that says the spoken words aren't the thing they represent. The models that you form of reality aren't reality. That's an incredibly prescient warning for something over 2000 years ago. And computer science is about symbols and the construction of models. And I just love the fact that I can go back this far in time and People have been smart for a very long time. So, jar-breakingly fast forward to, oh, I don't know, the 1940s. Um, there's a million people one could point to when talking about artificial intelligence, but it's very hard to miss Alan Turing. Um, if you don't know about Alan Turing, um, uh, I, it's a wonderful story. He was ridiculously brilliant. And as a mathematician, he's really the first person to conceptualize a machine that could take knowledge and act upon it. It had stored knowledge, but it could also do things with that knowledge and along the way, create new things. It was part of how Britain one did not get invaded by Germany is that Turing and his team used it to um, crack the Enigma code. Um, but much more important, I think Turing can be seen as sort of the place where suddenly knowledge wasn't something that sat statically on a page for the eyes of people. It, it started to do things. Um, I also have to say that if you want a dark chapter and how evil humans can be over homophobia, you just have to read about the end of Turing's life. He was persecuted for his homosexuality instead of revered for helping save Britain in the war. I have to say that because it needs to be said. Um, back to the main thing, though, theme, you know, I'm going to start this slide from the bottom up, lower left, a person interprets a Native American calendar inscribed, I've been seeing a lot of rock art in the last year, and it's utterly fascinating, and it's so humbling, because you know that there was so much thought that went into it, and yet so much time has passed that most of it you have to look at and go, I don't know how to read the book, I know it's a rich book, and I can make guesses, um, the knowledge has been lost despite the writing. After Alan Turing, we've got this funny thing happens. You can write down sequences of steps. You can write down the knowledge for how to cook a chicken or whatever you want to do. But then you can actually walk away and have something else, some machine, then do it, do calculations, et cetera. That creates this notion of books that can think for themselves. And because I'm about to draw an important contrast. Everybody here, I'm quite certain now, it's aware of the, a computer follows a sequence of instructions. And that's true. That is absolutely at some level, the way that I would teach a first week of what computers do. Um, and I would make some important points such as, there's a reason that there's a picture of Grace Hopper here. Computer science has been unfortunately underrepresented by women in the last 40 years, which is truly ironic because the men building all the hardware didn't think that 
the programming of the computers was important. So it fell to brilliant people like Grace Hopper and many others to be the first programmers. Um, programming is very difficult. Figuring out how to give instructions to a machine so it does what you want, it was hard. it's been hard since the beginning. It's still hard. Um, so a little bit of a point of inflection. I'm going to get to artificial intelligence, promise. Which, of course, will beg the question of what are people good at, what are machines good at? And that's with that in mind, it's good to keep aware that computers were built because they were better at something than human beings were when they were built, breaking encryption codes. Um, and they do have some really spooky properties like rote memorization. If you want to store the income tax returns of everyone in the United States, um, we don't blink an eye at the fact that a computer can do that. Um, if once upon a time, arithmetic was deemed as something, you know, impressive when people could do it. Um, machines do arithmetic. It's, it doesn't seem like near as much fun for people. I shouldn't say that for anyone who does Sudoku. Um, Publicals are still wonderful. Um, but machines are very good at those. Here's something they're not good at. And it's been my life's work. Um, when I entered graduate school in 1984, I wanted to study computer vision. And when I entered graduate school, computers were terrible at vision. If you showed a computer a, can a picture and hoped that it would say something intelligent, well, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Um, this picture is right off my homepage at Colorado State University. It goes along with the story that in my essay, Standard Graduate School, I apparently wrote on paragraph paragraph on page two that said, I wanted to understand how we as people walking down a trail could see a squirrel on a log and we would just instantly go squirrel. Wasn't, I mean, no work, just happens. And by the way, no useful introspection. One of the first things that you learned as a computer vision researcher is stop making up made up reasons why you think you're able to recognize a squirrel. You can't know why you, you just do it. And it's an amazing capability. And when I entered the field, computers just weren't even close. We didn't even have a language to talk about doing it properly. Which leads me to pattern recognition versus traditional computing. And this is going to come back and play a really central role in the little bit I'm going to try to do to give you a glimpse as to how modern artificial intelligence works. Um, on the left there, traditional computing, picture of Grace Hopper writing an early program. It was an art and a science for a human being to lay out a series of instructions, one instruction after another, to accomplish some task. And that was extraordinarily logical in the sense of do this, do that, do the following. No great surprise, people are curious and smart and a whole different group of people were interested in something called pattern recognition. And pattern recognition behaves very differently. You basically have a whole set of inputs that arrive instantly. All the stimulus on your retina in the last half a second. And the goal is to come up with a conclusion, world. Um, I studied Gestalt psychology as a computer scientist in graduate school. It was wonderful. Um, gestalt is a marvelous term for essentially getting to the essence of a complex pattern. And that's what we couldn't do well when I was in graduate school. We were flailing at it. Um, but it didn't mean that pattern recognition didn't seem important. Um, indeed, and I'll return to this theme a bit, in a little bit. At that very first conference in Dartmouth in 1957, there was at least two, if not, I think there were five leaders of the conference and they probably had seven views of how artificial intelligence was gonna to come to be. But two of them in particular squared off over logic, formal logic, deduction, reasoning, versus pattern recognition. And so the debate is not new as to how much human intelligence is just leaping to conclusions, just seeing a pattern going, oh, I, I think it's this. And there's really no deduction at all. It's just an association. 
Um, shouldn't come as a surprise also, because if you think about animal intelligence, um, animals are extraordinarily good at pattern recognition. It's what keeps them alive. So, um, ah, the snake, yes. If you are hiking, you've ever had this experience, if you really do start to step over a snake, you're going to be in motion. Your body will respond with an action before your frontal cortex comes up with a word. You, you, that's how fast pattern recognition is in animals. And fortunately, for that case, we have a good animal brain. So this takes us to, <laughs> this could take us so many places. I'm going to take us to a book called Thinking Fast and Slow. Um, this is a nod to the fact that as someone who does artificial intelligence, I think of myself as living next door to cognitive science and psychology. Um, happily living next door because it doesn't make any sense to study an artificial thing if you don't understand the real thing in front of you. And I would conversely argue at this point in the game, you really don't study the real thing without having very complex models of what it might be doing and her artificial intelligence. The fields are extraordinarily intertwined now. One of the ideas that's come into the forefront is as complex as human thinking is, you can grossly simplify it, and it is in some ways a gross simplification, and say humans have two different ways of thinking, fast and slow. I wasn't originally in love with those two adjectives for it, but it's useful. Slow is what you're thinking of when you're doing a Sudoku puzzle. Slow is the little voice in your head. Well, if that really was a zebra and it really was driving a car, dot, you know, trying to puzzle out what that means. And by the way, you can all think about it. I have no idea how to end that one. It's almost like a joke, but that would be slow thinking, fast thinking. The brain just leaps to a conclusion. There's It's stimulus response and it is done in a single bound. There's no deliberation. What's fascinating about the human mind is that thinking fast and slow work together. And I will come back to that at the end. So in terms of artificial intelligence as a field, I would argue that the kind of slow thinking has always been pretty nearby because it's not far off writing a program to play checkers or solve a logic mm -hmm. puzzle. Um, it's working out well-defined problems with well-defined language. It's not pattern recognition. It's the faster thinking, oddly, uh, you know, my and thousands of my colleagues' life work that was really harder to crack. It it just didn't tell you one thing. You can't write a computer program that says a squirrel has this much fur and this long a tail and yellow eyes and hope to get anywhere. It won't work. Well, language doesn't mean anything to understanding a picture of a squirrel. Um, so how does a computer recognize a squirrel? Well, I'm first going to go to a simpler question. I want you to notice the date 1940. And this is where I started in school. I was taught this paper probably in my first semester. The frog's eye tells the frog's brain. And it is surprising how seminal it really is because the, the authors there, McCullough and Pitts, are very famous now, began to model the way that nerves in a frog, where they could literally touch the nerves and count them. They weren't that complicated and they could study a frog. So here's a little puzzler for you. If I wiggle my finger here, a frog looking at it will snap his tongue thinking it's a fly. That's easy. There's another fly. Here's two flies. Where does the frog snap? It snaps to the middle. It goes right down the middle. It doesn't pick one. It averages them. That's one of the very first results ever to come out of the question, what do neural networks in animals compute? And to talk about, and by the way, now I get to use the word neural networks, but not quite, because first you have to think about, well, what's a single neuron? And if I were doing this in a formal uh, setting with people who study neurons, day and night and publish in it, they'd have my hide for this. This is called the simplified version, but it's totally sufficient. So I'm sticking with it. There's something called a dendritic tree. 
It's what receives inputs from all the other neurons in the neighborhood. If there's enough excitation hitting that dendritic tree, if the voltage is hit above a threshold, then the axon fires. And it's a singular event. Once it's fired, it has to shut up for a while. It has to recharge. But it sends a signal down to the synapse there in the bottom. And presumably that synapse then reaches out and touches the dendrites of a lot of nerves downstream. We're now almost to a neural network. At least we got one neuron tapping the tree, the dendrites of the next in line. So what can you do with this? I mean, you can do you, me, and you can do you with that. That's what we know. It's an existence proof. This is apparently sufficient for an awful lot. How it's sufficient has remained, I don't know, doggedly tough to work out. It didn't mean people didn't try. And you'll notice a theme in this talk about trying to get back to some basics, some basics that are now 60 years old plus. Um, Frank Rosenblatt invented a thing called a perceptron. And the perceptron was a device. It can now be just written as a computer program that would take a whole series of inputs. Think about the stimulus on the retina of an artificial eye. And it would sweep it through about three layers of neurons, one layer connected to the next, connected to the next. And I desperately don't mean you to see all the fine print in the two figures here. What I need you to see is the gestalt. There's two different pictures here. And it shows information coming in on the left in a retina and going out on the right as in the case of an animal, raise your right arm, might be left arm. On the bottom, it's make a decision, call this, a, call this an X. The point of the seeing the picture is notice the similarity. In 1960, it was, unabashedly the case that people were going, we need to emulate the way neurons do computation if we're going to solve pattern recognition problem, problems. Um, it's not quite James Bond. It's shaken, not stirred. Trained, not programmed. Um, there's a series of high points that, that in a short brown bag launch, I really do hope to give you a feel for. Programming is a human being sitting down inventing all the steps. In the case of an artificial neural network, like that early perceptron, in that early perceptron, there are over 200,000 possible connections between nerves. And each of those connections has to have a strength. And by the way, we allow for negative strengths. Not only can you excite your downstream, you can suppress it. So imagine trying to come up with off the top of your head 100,000 numbers between minus one and one so that this machine would do something useful. Well, there's something human beings can't do. It's just impossible. And it was impossible in 1960. So from the very beginning, there was this absolutely essential idea that you train a complex system to do pattern recognition. You don't write it from scratch to do pattern recognition. You're not smart enough. You don't have enough information. It, it's so wildly beyond any human being's ability that you instead substitute an idea, which is training. And here's, by the way, the early picture of a perceptron being trained. You'll never guess what letter it is trying to recognize. It's a C. Um, I love the fact that in those days, it was literally this painstaking. Show it one letter. The network makes a choice. Maybe you just assigned random connections between the nerves. You probably did. If the choice is correct, you tell it it's correct. If the choice is wrong, you tell it it's wrong. The network has a learning rule that goes with it, some component that lets it adjust the neural connections and adjust them a little bit and ask for the next letter and off you go and off you go and off you go hundreds of thousands of times. They can become incredibly capable by just repeated exposure to a trained training example that so any time in this lecture that I talk about training have this model in mind and realize that with modern computers and modern memories showing something five million examples repeatedly is something I do on my laptop in the middle of a lecture 
So we, we've come a long way in terms of quantity, but the fundamental idea of learning off label data is essential. So now I'm gonna jump forward, 2024. I'm retired, my work is done. How does a machine learn to see? Well, that neural network that had maybe two layers, often it's 50 layers deep. By the way, in a human being, it's estimated to be about eight layers deep. Visual cortex is at the back of our brains. Retinas, of course, are at the front. Um, it's astonishing how few layers of neural connections there are between um, the retinal input and a decision. Um, but our machines, it seems it's been easier to give them more layers. And there's 60 million different weights. Those are places where you have to decide how much this neuron talks to the next neuron. Um, what's training? 14 million is considered a small example set. Why does Google love to have lots of label data? Why does Google like to upload your photos and store them for free? If it can get a hold of the identification of those images, it can continue to train and it is constantly training. They're building better and better models for doing object recognition and they're by no means the only one. I mean, iNaturalist is getting better and better at flowers. All of these things involve training and probably the last two lines in the slide are the one I get most hit by my friends. Everything we've done has in some ways been detail. Now, there's a huge amount of detail in how weights are adjusted, how training is done, but you already now have in your mind, I hope, the really essential idea that how do these pattern recognition machines learn to come up with associations of inputs and outputs? It's by just being repeatedly shown lots of examples with answers. Um, object recognition just works. Um, I, I am on the road traveling right now and was at the Sonoran Desert Museum in Arizona and a little pack rat came up and sat next to my friend's foot. Um, so I took a picture of the pack rat, which means Google's never seen this image before. For this talk, I uploaded the picture and asked image.google.com what it was looking at. And it had no trouble. It showed me white tooth wood rat, which is wrong. Showed me a pat rat. That's actually the correct answer. But the fact that it's giving me a rat is pretty astonishing. Um, Object recognition will continue to get better, but you know, when I enter graduate school, something that's impossible is now a, a fun thing to do with Google or iNaturalist or wherever you choose to play with object recognition. By the way, also, it also recognized the brand of shoe they're wearing. So I've very quickly given you artificial neural networks how neuro, upstream neurons connect to downstream, pass information through this massively complex network, come up very quickly with conclusions. So how do we figure out what's really going on inside them? It's extremely hard. Um, we've kind of figured, we've known it was going to be hard for a long time. Uh, this book was written by Paul Cohen. It's Empirical Methods and Artificial Intelligence. It based, dates back to 1995 and it changed a lot of my career. Um, and it has an idea at its core that gets missed a lot when people talk about artificial intelligence. We build them. Um, we don't know exactly, we don't know what's going on inside. Let's be very clear. Now, <clears throat> I wanted to be careful with the slide. You know, the fundamental is how much can we predict the behavior of an artificially intelligent machine? It's kind of an important question. Well, at one level, a whole lot. If it has been designed to recognize images, it's not gonna magically start talking. That kind of artificial, that's science fiction on steroids. We're not there yet. We're, I doubt we'll ever be there per se. Um, you know, when we build these AIs, we as human beings define the space of what they get as inputs, the space of what they can do as outputs. So you don't get things that are just wildly crazy. They don't go off and have conversations on their own with their friends. They don't have friends. But the models that they build in order to solve the problems that they're solving are just not, you can't look at the weights in a network and make sense of it. But you can take an AI and you can study it like you'd study any 
animal that landed on your lab bench, except with one big advantage. You only get so many animals in a month in your lab. I can run as many, sky's the limit for how many times I run an algorithm. So I've worked in a particular area looking at what factors make face recognition algorithms perform better or worse on different with different kinds of algorithms. And I did about 15 years of research in this area. And I'm not going to tell you about all the research, but there's a couple of things I do want you to think about because you'll see it in the press and it's important. One, if the system finds Asians easier to recognize than whites, it's not malice towards whites. And you can swap whatever race you like into this. These, these are devices. They don't have malice. They're not, when we say they're biased, be very careful. That, that usually in human vernacular sort of implies an intent. There's no intent. It's doing what it was trained. It did the best it could with its training. Um, and odds are very good that you can modify the training and you can correct. Once you identify a problem, you can odds are correct it. And this last one is subtle. If we learn something else from psychology, it's that because most of us do a lot of pattern recognition subconsciously and barely consciously, we all carry implicit biases. It's just not, you, you don't get to be a thinking human being without them. It's really hard for us as individual human beings to ferret out and reveal and quantify our implicit biases. That's not true of an AI. If I want to put an AI in charge of hiring for a company, I can study it ad infinitum. I can figure out all kinds of things about its biases. And if I have the will to do it, which I would, um, it can be fixed. That's often left unsaid. Um, so what's going on inside a trained network? It's not easy, but we can study them in excruciating detail. We can, we do, we should. Um, something now that's kind of in its infancy is trying to make sense of the internal representations that are being constructed by a modern object recognition neural network. Boy, that's a bunch of big words. Um, what changed in the last 20 years is, remember I said there are 50 layers? Why are there 50 layers? It's because the network is figuring out intermediate patterns, stepping stones along the way to making a decision. And What's utterly intriguing is there's increasing evidence. It's still a very new science that those representations have a lot in common with the representations human beings are building. And so this next picture is an example of something called style transfer. I'm going to tease you a little bit. I'm going to give you a punchline about it first. Then we get to look at the cool picture. So this whole style transfer, when I first saw it, about five years ago, I thought it was a parlor trick. I thought, oh, they're just shifting pixels around. This, this is silly. Um, I didn't like it. I thought it was one more example where the curmudgeon in me surfaced. But then I spent probably about two months reading the papers, and I'll spare you all that. What I convinced myself was they're actually showing us something very deep about what's inside the neural nets that solve object recognition today. And it allows them to do things like re- Take as input a photograph, I took this one on the Rio Grande two weeks ago, and turn it into a painting in the style of Monet. That's actually pretty amazing. And I promise you, it's not just shifting little paint pixels here or there. It's working on the internal representation of that original image and then sort of piping it out through an abstraction mechanism in the spirit of Monet. And more on this as the future unfolds. This is my nod to the internal representations that are being formed. We can push and poke at them, and they're fascinating. And you know what we want to conclude about similarity to human beings or not, there's still a lot of work to be done, but it is at the least intriguing. All right. So sort of wrapping up the pattern recognition part, this whole ability to go to... For instance, think in pictures. I have to plug Temple Grandin. If you've not read Temple Grandin's books, I strongly recommend thinking in pictures. Animals make us human. Uh, she is a professor at Colorado State University. Um, I think she's every bit as insightful, as wonderful as advertised. Um, I also really recommend the book Blink to you. 
Uh, Malcolm Gladwell is a brilliant writer to sort of make hard science come alive without all the citations. <laughs> and he describes better than I can what is also called fast thinking, this part of the brain that just goes input, conclusion, I know the answer. So what about natural language? Well, you've all heard about ChatGPT. Here's ChatGPT 3.1. I had fun with it about a week ago. I asked, what do you get when you let an artificial intelligent neural network learn to answer questions based on training with most of what has appeared on the World Wide Web? Answer. Well, first notice, it's a little formulaic. First, it restates my question. Then it says, you get a powerful AI model. It's very proud of itself. That can do human-like text. Um, true. And there's a lot going on there. Um, what I want to tell you about things like chat GPT, well, first a little bookkeeping, they're called large, large language models, chat GPT. They work with language, not pictures, although people are putting the two together. Um, it's really just a big network with a lot of neurons connected through weights in the spirit of what I've already shown you. Um, of course, there are 175 billion different weights to pick that have to all be picked by training. And it's shown some sizable chunk of what's on the World Wide Web in, the, in English. By the way, it's also part of it I read is now converted to Icelandic. Um, and it creates... Um, from all of this information, perhaps the biggest surprise of the last 10 years is it appears to speak quite eloquently about all sorts of different things. And so it is every bit the monumental change that people have sort of thought it was. This changes the game for, not only do we have object recognition, we've got something that you can ask it a question or discuss something with it and it sure starts to feel like you're talking to another person, but a person with access to most of what was written on the internet. So we all now get to figure out what it means to go forward with something like this. But I also have a particular point that I want to give you about the fact that perhaps G chat GPT thinks a little bit too much like a person. Um, I love peanuts. I hope a lot of my audience loves peanuts. Um, I am certainly hope you know that Linus is Lucy's little brother and that Sally is Charlie Brown's little brother. This seems pretty straightforward. So let's give ChatGPT a go. Uh, please tell me about the peanuts character, Charlie Brown. Let's say that I'm in second grade and I have to write an essay for second grade. ChatGPT is gonna write a good essay. Um, nothing wrong with this. It's all pretty straightforward. So. Wow, we're there, aren't we? Okay. Hey, ChatGPT, tell me about Charlie Brown's siblings. Well, Charlie Brown has two siblings, Sally Brown and an unnamed sister, denoted my illustration with a question mark. I couldn't really figure out if that's true. The internet isn't strong enough and I don't have the kind of memory to remember one strip where maybe there was an unnamed sister. I can't tell. It's a little bit odd, but I'm willing to sort of let it slide. Certainly, it got the Sally part right. Life's good. Who is Linus in the Peanuts comics? Linus is Lucy Van Pelt's younger brother. Oh, we're, we're doing great here. We've achieved general intelligence. Yippee. Tell me about Charlie Brown's little brother. Charlie Brown's little brother is named Linus Van Pelt. Oops, or to quote Charlie Brown, good grief. Um, some ways I can't make this stuff up. <laughs> I was delighted when I stumbled across this playing with chat GPT because I think it makes a lot of points all at once. Um, it clearly doesn't really understand what it said before or siblings. And it gets better because does Charlie Brown have a little brother? Well, apparently... They've been trying to get chat GPT to, you know, pay attention to what you asked before. So this is the first time I ever got an apology from an AI. Apologies for the confusion. In fact, I'm going to read it from the next slide. Apologies for the confusion. 
Charlie Brown does not have a little brother in Charles Schultz's Peanuts comic strip. He is an only child in the series. However, he does have a younger sister named Sally Brown. And people ask me if I'm worried about the robots taking over. Ross, I have a question. Yes. What do you do to avoid filling it full of disinformation? To te How can you teach it or can you teach it to discriminate facts versus alternative facts? And how do you get it to do what it just did with this one and not the first time it gave you a response? Why didn't it identify that that was a problem before? Let me repeat the question. How do you get something like chat GPT to discriminate facts from misinformation? Is that a fair summary? Yes. It's extremely difficult. Um, and I, please get me back to that question, but it's actually gonna come up in about the next, um, well, in fact, it's the bottom of this slide. So. Okay, I see. It, the short answer is you cannot easily. It's not how chat GPT works. It's not how a neural net works. Um, part of what I'm trying to get convey in a short time is people, for example, worry that these systems are just repeating what they read in one article. That is absolutely not true. What's fascinating about something like chat GPT is it read everything and it threw it into this giant mishmash, a lot like a brain where it associates stuff. And then it can turn around and use those associations to cough up quick responses, thinking fast. It has no ability to know whether what it just coughed up actually makes sense. It doesn't have a backup model. All it has is that ability to just end run to, well, here's something that sounds good. So I think now I can answer the question. Um, it's monumentally difficult. It's part of why we're not there yet for anything that would look like artificial intelligence that we as human beings would be thoroughly satisfied with because a human being, any adult would have been embarrassed to pieces if it had given you the three sentence I'm showing on the top of the slide. And yet I promise you if there was an easy way for open AI to fix this, they would. And by the way, there's lots of, Patches. There are band-aids all over something like ChatGPT to catch things like this, but which are offensive. So you can invest a human amount of energy putting duct tape over all the places it makes mistakes, but fixing its internal way of thinking is extraordinarily difficult. Okay, I hope that answered that question. Yeah, I have another question. Does yeah. it? Um, are we working on teaching it to think slowly? <laughs> I, I invited that question. I'm <laughs> sure someone is. If I was 28 years old and starting out as an assistant professor, that's what I would be working on right now. I would uh -huh. be working on the interface between fast and slow thinking. Because as I, I, I basically tipped off, tipped my hand to this the way I designed the talk. You know, deductive logical reasoning is something a computer can do instinctively. It's the language it's built in. So I don't see a fundamental problem ever bringing the two together but let's go back to that 175 billion that were place you go to find you got you you got halted Just restart that sentence oh. go back to um it's easy to do the slow thinking for example planning if you look at how modern corporations do planning they use planning algorithms that are very good slow thinkers and they come up with optimal plans. I mean, we see that all the time. Google gives you a route. Yes, it makes mistakes, but it's astonishing how well it does most of the time. The slow working out of sequences of steps is mainstream. But where I probably got interrupted is there are 175 billion weights between neurons inside chat GPT. Which neuron is responsible for making the mistake about Linus? And why, when I change the input slightly, does it change its mistake? That's almost unfathomably difficult. And I suspect the next generation of AI researchers are going to be working on exactly that. How do we start? You know, human beings do have this fascinating ability for slow thinking to 
rewrite what the fast thinking does. And I, I'm an optimist, you're an optimist about these things getting better. We'll probably learn how to do this, but it's not gonna come in the next year. Okay, I hope that helped. Thank you. The next year is soon. What about, is it really likely in the next year? Are we talking five years or what, what are oh, we looking I, at? I think fast and slow thinking is 20 to 100 years out. I think it's much harder than we give it credit. That's what I thought. Okay, thank you. So I have a few takeaway messages as I'm wrapping up. Um, when I entered graduate school, I don't think we had a clue what was going on between the retina and visual cortex. It just seemed like we all were magic which was cool. We're not magic. We can now build things that do exactly what we do in terms of object recognition. Um, and it's all, <laughs> that's generalized. Um, the fact that skill comes through extensive training, by the way, to be clear, I'm telling you here in bullets, things that I hope that when you walk away from this lecture tomorrow, you'll go, I think you said something about object recognition is a solved problem, et cetera. Uh, large language models, ChatGPT, they do know a lot. They write better than me on a bad day. It, it is a little spooky what they're good at, but I hope I've driven home to you just how deeply confused they can become and how that's not just a six-month fix. It's fundamental. It's endemic to what they're doing. A few more things that come up. Uh, I often get asked about the robot apocalypse and the only way to get shot in your sleep by a robot is to give it a gun. And among the roboticists, I personally know that's considered a really bad idea. All right. I then had to say, I apologize. I don't mean to sound glib with this. Um, I've worked with a lot of roboticists over 40 years, and I often work with the Department of Defense. And if there's anything I'm concerned about is that some of the norms and accepted things you would just never do are being broken now. So... Um, I still think we're completely capable of avoiding a robot apocalypse, but it means being smart in what we do and don't let robots do. Um, and this is something I've heard very few people talk about. So it's coming straight for me. And I'm sorry if it seems a little half baked, but I think it's important to know where the off switches are. As we go forward with AI, the current technologies we have need off switches that I can get control of. Um, and it's going to get stronger with AI. Basically, don't make a machine you cannot turn off. And if turning it off is going to cost you so dearly that you're reluctant to turn it off, go back to square one and think about what kind of a machine you built and what kind of a system you were building where you needed it like that. Um, and I don't think this is being adequately followed. And particularly, um, who gets to turn off the switches? Uh, we're not in a very good place right now. We as, we as the consumers of these amazing devices very seldom have sufficient access to the on-off switches. Um, and the apologies, small is beautiful, but this the connection on demand is better. Um, will my job go away? Um, this one's hard. Yes, a lot of jobs are a lot of jobs are going to change profoundly. And I'm going to before I even go back to AI, we're already there. I mean, we've been there for the, since the industrial revolution and probably long before. We as human beings are curious creatures. We keep trying to invent new ways to do things. And every time we invent a new way to do things, well, it changes everything. Writing changed what it meant to be an educated, intelligent human being. Spoken language before that changed what it meant to be a thinking human being. We now have knowledge that thinks, that does, that thinks for itself. That's going to change everything. But even the internet, the internet's pretty amazing. What's the average weight of a wombat? You know, Google it. You could come up with the answer to that in 15 seconds. I have students do that in classes. Um, the notion that you should keep a lot of facts in your head just for the sake of keeping them, that's dead and gone. That died in the last 15 years. But it's been replaced by something much more subtle. All of us have to have enough knowledge to formulate a useful query. That's really what knowledge means now. You know, because you're not going to beat Google for breadth of knowledge, but you somehow have to know enough to ask the right question. And you have to have the sense to spot the right answer when it comes back. And I think those are, if anything, the highest aspiration of human, you know, if I'm a positive, positive about things, that's the good news. That's where we're gonna have no lack of challenges because that's what education has to be about is satisfying those two things. Um, 
and about changing jobs. If you'd love to fill out forms, please raise your hand. You don't need to do it. I'm not expecting a lot. Um, there's one form of AI I really cannot wait to see deployed soon enough. Um, I, my daughter's actually just been accepted to medical school, so I'm not slamming doctors. And yes, I'm shamelessly bragging. Um, modern medical examination protocols demand trained people to split their attention between me, a patient, and a laptop. It's ludicrous. I'm a computer scientist. I'm on a laptop right now. I like computers. But what a horrible waste of human attention and talent to have it sitting at a keyboard when I'm sitting there as the patient. AI in its current form could pick up this slack. There is simply no reason why forms need to be filled out in a medical office by, a, by the doctor who's doing the examination or necessarily even a person. Forms are by definition what computers are good at. So I like to see, you know, people say what's going to happen in the future with AI assisting people in day-to-day -day chores, more people on people time and less people on laptop time. And I'm going to be pretty happy with that. Okay. With that, thank you. And if there are any questions, I am happy to field them. I'm also going to stop screen sharing. Um, how, what are the main fears regarding AI and are they realistic? Do, how do we teach them ethics or morality? Are the fears founded? I'll well, do the first part. No, the fears are mostly overblown right now. As someone in the field, and by the way, let's be clear. I think we're talking about the fields where AI is somehow all band together one night and take control of the internet and we wake up as slaves. Um, that's just not going to happen. <laughs> um, fear that they're going to disrupt and destroy the systems we've built them to, ma to maintain. Oh, I don't know, the world online banking system. No, we're not. We're fortunately not that stupid when there's that much money on the line. And that point about off switches and thinking hard about inputs and outputs and what really can and can't be controlled, uh, I'm not worried about that. Um, teaching them ethics, thats I, I put that one off. I'm not even sure how that works. We can treat, we can train them to behave in ways that meet some standards that we have, for example, um, avoiding racial bias in programs that make decisions about, oh, hiring. We don't have to teach them ethics. They don't have to necessarily not understand the ethics, but we can certainly make sure that the systems that we use are behaving ethically because we can simply look at what they do and make sure that they do. Teaching ethics so that it could actually turn around and explain ethics to me, that's hard. Other questions? Can AI help people who are blind? Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I actually wanted to work at this at one point. And by the way, I don't know this field. So I'm, I'm, I'm making wild guesses here. But something as simple as eyeglasses that give an audio translation of what is directly in front of you, I... I expected it to be a product 10 years ago, because again, I'm a technical optimist and I don't know if you can buy it today, but if you can't buy it today, you sure ought to be able to, and it's just a matter of time. Okay, how do we train young people how to address current AI challenges and how to think about these challenges? Are we doing it and at what levels? High school, junior high, grade school, college, obviously. Ooh, how much time do I have? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, you have another half hour. <laughs> okay. Well, me... well, it's probably a good time to do a slight plug. The last thing that I did as a researcher is I was one of national science. I was a co-principal investigator on a National Science Foundation Institute on artificial intelligence and K through 12 education. So I thought a lot about related questions of AI and education. And the question's slightly different. How do we teach you know, K through 12 and college to work with AIs and to do it productively. Um, it's a lot of the basics. Learn to think critically, learn to think independently, learn to never take at face value something that an AI tells you. And by the way, 
probably don't take at face value something only one person tells you or that you read on the internet. Learn the skills of what it means to push for a real answer as opposed to how to quickly get the answer. Um, there's nothing, by the way, everything I just said is recorded. There is nothing surprising in what I just said. Um, the next one's also not terribly surprising, but I think it's getting lost. There's the initial reaction to chat GPT among my professor friends was fascinating and it split about 50-50. Uh, about 50% said, if you dare use chat GPT in any part of this assignment, I will expel you from the school for cheating or do whatever I can to make your life miserable. The other half said, your first draft will be the chat GPT responses you got. Your second draft will be yours. I like the second approach better because it's accepting the inevitable. Um, I don't know many people. Too many young people I know who are smart are already using these tools. Um, and they're using them correctly. Um, they're using them to sort of get that blank page filled with something and then realizing, and it's, and I'm totally cool with it. If what happens then is you've now basically got an accelerated learning program on, on what it means to take an essay full of mistake, full of possible mistakes and possible awkward, obvious wandering parts that don't belong and turn it into something that a human being would really like to read. That's another aspect of answering it. Um, I'm going to leave it there. I don't know that I fully did that question adequately, but oh, I'm not getting your sound. Are we just dealing with this at the collegiate level? Or are we starting earlier? Are we trying to deal with elementary and junior high and high school teachers? on all these issues or is it getting lost in the shovel shuffle i am not qualified to answer that question um i i have so much respect for the people who are still doing the work k through 12 every day it's an incredibly hard job one of my best friends is now a retired school teacher from fourth grade and i look at how hard she worked and how hard i worked and it's not fair <laughs> You know, she worked harder than I did. Um, and it's not that I didn't work hard. Um, is it being given short shrift? Probably. That we have a chronic issue. Let's call it direct. We have not paid school teachers enough to get a person like me to teach in K through 12 for my entire lifetime. If you're good with computers, the only reason you're in K through 12 is because you made a very conscious decision to forsake perhaps four times as much income per year. And as long as we consider public schools to be that okay, we're always gonna have a problem because it's, it's the same thing with math. One of my uh, great friends at UCSD um, originally wanted to be a math teacher, K through 12. This is 40, nearly 50 years, 45 years ago. And you know he left after two years, it, it's tough. I wish I could sugarcoat this. I wish I could tell you, Oh, I think there's a brand new curriculum that's going to really do this well. But I, I think the real answer is in the United States, we are not really taking, we're working hard on STEM, but I don't think that STEM, and this really comes under science, technology, et cetera. I don't think it's getting the resources it really needs, starting with the fact of drawing back into K through 12, the kind of people who could do this stuff easily. Anyway, there's an answer. Okay. Um, Julie Fulkerson said, I'm loving this great presentation. Thank you. Please do another. And I have a suggestion. <laughs> I will be talking to you about that <laughs> after your vacation. <laughs> but um, meantime, are there any other questions? I don't see any. Oh, wait a minute. There's three new messages I haven't looked at. I'm sorry. Well, I'll add to my comment. Um, mostly it was about thanking you for this amazing presentation. Um, and I want to point out sort of a short-term moment right now in time here about slow thinking versus fast thinking. Humboldt, of course, is in a, in a serious situation. And it's amazing to me that how difficult it is for them to come up with solutions. And I don't think AI is going to really help with this. And I was slightly distracted at the beginning of this presentation because I'm helping them to find venues for uh, graduation ceremonies, for concerts and things like that that need to happen. The students are devastated. And um, I just, it's kind of a, it's a perfect timing for this. 
about how AI can be helpful and how in the long run, really, we just have to think creatively and be connected to each other, which is part of what I love about Malcolm Gladwell's work, that he talks about connectors. And I don't know, maybe someday we'll have a massive database. But I, I mean, for example, I know where the pianos are, where the students who need to practice can practice right now because they have um, performance juries coming up and they're freaking out. And I think every day, everyone in this group here is probably solving problems for the community in the moment. And uh, I just, I love this, have more of these and also add that sort of like, how does the brain really work? <laughs> I love yeah. that. That's, I'm not a science person at all, but I learned from uh, someone years ago who said, the brain cannot reject a question, but can reject a fact. And, and we have lots of examples of people ignoring and disputing facts, but there's lots of times we have to still keep asking the questions to keep ourselves fresh. So thanks so much. I love this. Julie, why don't you look into the community for us at the community center up there? Did I? No. Have you considered that? It's oh no! For, there's I have a whole long for list. Graduation, and, for example. So there's there's lots of possibilities, but for yeah. some reason it takes a village, as always, to come up with the solutions. Okay, thank you. Uh, Peter says, "What about deep fakes? How do they work?" What about deep fakes and how do they work? I showed you that I could take a picture that I took and re render it as though Monet painted it. If I can do that, I can do all kinds of things. Um, three we things. lost you. Oh, yeah. well, good. I was pausing. I didn't say much. So oh. <laughs> three things about that. Um, we're going to have to learn to live with them. Is the first. They're just a consequence of our technology, and everyone's going to have to take some responsibility for not believing everything they see. Um. Can deep fakes be detected? Oh yeah, um, it's not trivial. The, one of the biggest, I think of it as intellectual arms races that's underway and it's not gonna slow down, is my AI is gonna be trained to try to figure out what your AI is trying to do to confuse me. <laughs> Meaning, um, what is a fact? When do I believe something? Uh, AI is gonna play a role in both sides of that war that is it's it's not a future tense we're in the middle of that right now as we all know yeah so Are i we... will for example have a program that identifies that you're creating a deep fake oh absolutely it's been yes i'm sorry if i bury the lead it is a very active area of research how do you determine that something's been tampered with that it's not real um it's hard, to, you know, every year it gets harder to do because the fakes get better. But I actually suspect that with enough time and effort, the fakes will all will be easily detected by the right AI human being teams. Okay, Peter, did you have something else you wanted to ask? Yeah, I was going to ask, um, are we in any kind of like an arms race with uh, with China on AI capabilities. Absolutely, I mean, I hate to call it an arms race, but you know, there's a great yeah. time. most of my money for all of my research came from the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. It comes straight from the DoD and the Secretary of Defense into DARPA. Why does it come that way? Because after World War II, the United States didn't ever want to be surprised by a technology again. And I smile when I say that. It has been really wonderful working with DARPA. It's been one of the most creative and freeing group. You know, it gave us the internet. It really did. You know, a lot of stuff comes out of this. And much of what I talked about today in this talk was funded by the Defense Department. Why? Because the United States made a decision after World War II. We did not want to be surprised. China watches us closely and has learned what we do well. And I actually helped organize an international face recognition algorithm competition, which all academic groups around the world could participate in. And the winning institution, no question about it, this is 2015, was the Chinese Institute of Science and Technology. They took it very seriously. Um, 
when frankly, it's still hard, you know, China's taking research very seriously. And I would really not, now I love to be Winnie the Pooh and cheerful, but I can't be cheerful about China's use of AI. It's horrible. You know, if you want to look for a dystopian image of what face recognition and AI and social media is going to look like in a society that's abusing it to centralize power and control, you just have to look at China. It's scary. So while I have lovely colleagues, scholars in China who I talk to, um, yeah, I don't know if I'd call it an arms race, but it sure represents two very fundamental different approaches to technology. And it's scary to me a bit. They used it during the pandemic to keep people from going places they didn't want them to go, let alone Absolutely. even out of their apartments. What do you think about brain, brain computer interface work? Oh, I don't want one. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to be augmented? No, I think that Patrick Stewart and his Picard did a pretty good job of talking me out of that idea. Um, <laughs> I, it's like everything else. No, I mean, having said I don't want it, there's going to be some strange health conditions where it's going to make sense and where I would be, I would be loath to deny it under some circumstances. But let's go back to my comment about know where the off switch ought. Always know where the off switch is. Always have make sure you have an off switch, that you have enough off switches to control the AI that you seem to be so dependent on. That's going to get so dicey if it's inside your brain. So I don't really know how that works, and I'm highly nervous and skeptical. Is there, uh, Barbara asks, is there a chat program that will give an answer and then other possible answers? Like a list of possible answers? <laughs> Yes. Graded by quality. <laughs> um, well, first off, I'm not really, that, I retired two years ago and a lot of this stuff happened the last two years, but yes, reading between the lines of things I did to prepare for this talk, uh, ChatGPT has some debugging modes that the developers have, and they can basically ask ChatGPT what its next answer would be, for example, and why it didn't give it. Um, now, its explanation of why it didn't give it is pretty mealy mouth. It's, it's kind of like, well, because it wasn't because the probability you wanted me to say that was 0.7 and the one I gave you was 0.75. It, it, it's not deeply reasoned, but but yes, the short answer so it's, is- It's based on probabilities. Um, yeah, kind of, mm -hmm. I, hand wave, hand wave. Sure, it's based on, these programs are trained to try to get an answer that matches the labeled training data or the expectation as often as possible, which leads to another thing. They, they're kind of by nature bland, which is something that's going to get more and more obvious as they become more and more used. They, they're, they're looking for a safe response that matches what would most likely have come next. And in that sense, yes, the most probable. Safe. That's an interesting word to use. Safe response. Safe for them. Huh? Safe for, safe them. for them. They don't get They don't get slapped for doing the wrong answer. Oh, do they get slapped? That's what <laughs> how do they get yeah, that's slapped? how training works. Training. Huh? Um, when they're training these things, they are perfectly capable of saying that's a wrong answer and it will go adjust its weights. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. That's part of the training. Is there a chat program uh, that will give, oh, I'm sorry, best presentation ever on Holly Brown Bag? Thank you. Please come back. Consider yourself invited. Thank you. <laughs> I'll send you the proposal form again. <laughs> we love it. Um, Kate Hitt says, I publish literature and I'm asked by the Library of Congress and Copyright Office if I am using AI. Just to let you know, AI cannot apply. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I, that, that's actually a wonderful observation. And, you know, it's no great surprise. One of the things I see coming, AIs can't have the same rights as us people. And, you know, and I'm not going to get suckered into the don't you feel sorry for the poor AIs and, you know, aren't we treating them like second class? No, they're AIs. And, you know, one of the classics is I don't feel like an AI has a right to phone me on my cell phone. That that just strikes me as a, there are not a lot of rules I want to put in place, but that's one of them. And yeah. I just wait, the, the, the current uh, Supreme Court may decide it's people. It's a yeah. person, has rights to vote. Wait. <laughs> And donate. <laughs> Sorry. Oh no, I, okay. I, I followed you. Yeah, hope not. 
Any other questions from anybody? Speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to say one thing. Bob, I loved your question. I've written a five paragraph answer. And next time we go for a walk on the beach, we can talk about it. One of my friends here gave me a very good series of questions, but I don't think we have time. We do. It's we, You got 15 minutes. <laughs> um, you're the moderator, Jane. Do you want to touch that or not? Well, go go for it. Okay. Let me shorten. Um, so my friend Bob said, in the 21st century, we have seen technology change the speed at the speed of almost light, while humans she, speed, change at the speed of sociology, which is a lovely sentence. Thus, tremendous unintended consequences have occurred from these are increased suicide rates, disruption of our attempts at democracy. I think of AI as like our old tech, but on steroids. Yes. Uh, there's no safety testing on the human outcomes from new technology. Just because we can do it does not mean we should or that we should let necessarily others profit. And I'm sorry, Bob, I did not read it verbatim, but it's pretty close. Um, and so, yeah, I actually spent time thinking about it. There's, that, that rate, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, let me take the... Um, Oh, the first place I would go with the question is, one of the things that we see pre-AI is corporations for profit seek our attention. This is no great surprise, right? Advertising. Um, and so this may seem out of topic, it's not. My father, who was himself a technologist, hated advertising. I mean, he didn't mind, he didn't find it annoying. He hated it. He found it corrosive to culture and society, and he thought it was damaging us. And the little TV he would watch, he had a little 10-foot dowel he made in his wood shop with a rubber foot, and he would sit and he would poke the sound button off as soon as the commercials came off and then poke it back on when we were watching The Wonderful World of Disney. So I got raised from an early age to think that maybe not everybody deserved my attention. And that's something else that's now hitting us with stero on steroids, so to speak, with social media and AI will just exacerbate it. Um, if you look at how Facebook operates, you'll notice there is no way to turn off its insidious, it's done, they don't even call it advertising. It's the, by the way, since you happen to care about your brother, Bill, um, here's some stuff about something happening around the world that you should have no reason to care about, but we, we want you to see it anyway. Uh, I find that insidious. I would have respect for if there was a simple little button in the upper right-hand corner of Facebook said, turn off all the feed stuff so nothing gets shoved at me except my family. I would have respect for them as an institution. <laughs> Sorry, that, that caught in my throat. That's not going to happen. Their their whole business model is, pre is predatory and predicated on basically stealing our attention. And there's a lot of that going on. And I don't have a good fix for it. Um, there, I did sort of hint at one. Um, I think that you have to be able to turn off parts of AI. And I think you have to be able to turn off parts of social media and parts of information. I should be able to have filters in place. And also, I don't usually like laws, but if someone is feeding me information, if my AI, AI agent, if my, I have a personal assistant that's an AI and it suddenly tells me to go eat here, if it's being paid or the person who made us being paid, to tell me that, that's law. We need law that says, oh, I'm sorry, that 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 just can't come out of the mouth of the same agent. It has to change voice. It has to turn into the PT Barton salesman voice. Hi, oh, I'm a, I'm going to tell you to go get a burger. You know, make a fool of itself. But it can't mix what it's doing seriously with what it's doing commercially. There has to be a way of distinguishing. So there's one, Bob. I don't know if you saw that coming, um, but that's under who's selling what to who. Um, you also asked about suicide rates going up. So I went and looked at it and it's a perfect case study in how we use the internet. Are suicide rates going up in teenagers? How does one answer that question? I didn't ask chat GPT, I promise you. You know, it, it took some Googling and we all, this gets back to the K through 12 teaching people. You know, it's not easy knowing where to go on the internet to trust what you read. Um, on this one, I went to some statistics journals and I went to, 
a dot gov for a national institutes of health absolutely suicide rates have gone up a bit i then cheated and asked a friend of mine who's a colleague who's quite knowledgeable about this and he said uh yeah they've gone from about 10 in 100,000 to about 14 in 100,000. And it's probably got something to do with social media. Of course, then he gave me a pointer to a very complex paper that says, here's an interesting little thing scientists don't understand. They can know, they can find an association between whether a teenager has ever been on social media and increased suicide rate. They can find no curve that says more time on social media means more likely to commit suicide. It, it's, it's missing. They've looked and they can't find it. So th I just leave it with even something that seems like an obvious conclusion that, you know, this new technology is making more teenagers kill themselves. These things aren't simple. And last but not least, um, I'm the notion of safety. If we're talking about good practices, you know, I, I'm the one who wrote, don't give a robot a gun. And I'm pretty upset about our defense department not following that. Um, I think that there are places where laws might work, but if you think of artificial intelligence as a way of amplifying knowledge and transmitting knowledge between people, I'm petrified of setting up safety standards that would lead to, for example, this particular AI being banned because it doesn't convey the correct information. And giving power to government to do that just gets worse. It, it, it gets into a very strange area. So testing the effects of these new technologies on people, it's actually being done a lot. A lot of my re last five years of research was setting up experiments with people, working with systems to see how they would react to this versus that. We, we can study all these things. Giving the force of law to saying this technology is not safe, unless it involves a physical device that can do physical harm, if it involves knowledge, speech, facts, not facts, my facts, your facts, I don't want to give that power to government. So there's my short short answer to Bob's question. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions anybody wants to pop on us? Annie Reed says, thank you for an excellent informative presentation. And I thank you for taking time on your vacation to do prep prep for this and do this. It was wonderful, very helpful, and we would like to invite you to come back. So feel free to put together another one. Meantime, next Monday on May 6th, Louisa Rogers will be talking about creativity at any age. She took a watercolor class at age 30, didn't pick up a paintbrush for another 40 years, and now she paints often has developed a non-traditional artistic style that is uniquely her own. In this slideshow presentation, she'll offer suggestions for how to discover your personal style, whatever form of expression you pursue, not just art. So we look forward to your coming back. Louisa is very entertaining, very smart, very much fun. So we hope you'll come back and join us again and wish Ross a wonderful trip. Thank okay. you, Jean, for doing this for us. We really appreciate it. Well, I thank Ross for doing it. Yes, thank you, Ross. <laughs> <laughs> Joanne told me she had this fascinating new neighbor. Mm -hmm. And it's like, thank you. I got on the phone immediately. <laughs> so if anybody else has suggestions like that, I am putting together the talks for the summer. Feel free to get in touch with me right away. I have to get it done this week. Thank so you, Jane. Will you're do. most welcome. Look forward to seeing you all next week and certainly at all the classes. All right. Thank you. Have fun. Have a great week.